Hi, everybody. It's your host, Kay Did. Welcome back to Hero Voices. Thank you for coming and listening to us this week. I just want to ask you a few things, actually. I need you guys to follow me on social media because we definitely are trying to grow in our community. And the way of doing that is by joining our family here, but also joining us on social media. We put out information a couple of times a day, um, usually Monday to Friday, about different things that's happening in our community, how you can help, how you can join. We give our different topics like that. We also follow people that we know who's in this fight also to help with homelessness and things like that also. So everything will be down below, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. We're, we're everywhere. We're trying to branch out and see how we can grow and be able to help. And more, like I always say, more voices is better than just one voice, you know, because it gets the word out and we'll be able to help more people by using our voices. So today we actually have some amazing people. And you know, this month is Women's History Month. And also, apparently, I didn't know this one. I just learned this like a couple of weeks ago, um, Brain Injury Month. I want to say if I'm saying that properly. So I want to make sure we have information about that because a lot of times we don't, in this um industry, we don't think about those kind of things. Topic today is going to be about DV, which you know, I always say we shouldn't talk about DV only in October. DV is happening all the time. <laughs> No matter what month we are in, I know we put it for that month, but it's happening all the time. And if you don't know what DV is, we're going to be saying the words interchangeably in this episode is DV is domestic violence. So we want to make sure that's clear. So we just want to say acronyms that you don't know what they're talking about, but we are talking about domestic violence and how that actually affects people and people's lives. So as you know, um, our topic is usually all about families, but DV affects everybody. No matter if you're a family or not a family, as long as a person hurting another person, that's DV, and DV comes in different levels. It could be, um, you know, people talking bad about you, the person you're with talking bad about, about you. It could be a parent to a child, honestly. You'd be surprised how much kids are get damaged because of their own parents. You might not think about that. Um, it could be financial, it could be physical, it could be in many different ways. So we wanna make sure we can cover all of that in this episode and also make sure you understand what this program is actually gonna be about and who's gonna be helping. So you can introduce yourself now to the audience of Hera Voices. Thank you for coming on and helping us understand more about what you're doing in our community. So my name is Jacqueline Coyasso, and I am the Sector Director of Domestic Violence Services for Volunteers of America, Greater New York. We oversee seven, I oversee with my team, seven domestic violence shelters across New York City. And we're in distinct neighborhoods and we're just so happy to be here. And here, I'm here with my colleague, Carmen. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Carmen Fernandez. I am the Assistant Sector Director. And I also ask Ms. Coyato to see the seven programs that we have CDY in New York for Volunteer of America. So let's get into it. Can you please tell us what the program that you are starting is actually launching this month, guys. So that's also why I want to get this topic out there because it's launching this month. The more people can hear about it, the more people can know about it, the more people can actually help. So tell us about your program, what's the name of it, who's going to be getting it and things like that. So we have had our pilot program for brain trauma since October, 2022. And this has been a pilot program that we started during Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And just like you shared as well, we have to acknowledge that domestic violence exists every day, not only in October, but all year round. But obviously during Domestic Violence Month in October, 2022, we, we went off with a bang and we wanted to put knowledge out there to folks that you know, supporting survivors on emotional abuse, financial abuse, sexual abuse is very important, but we have to do better as service providers, as advocates and supporting our survivors on the healing of physical abuse. And when we say physical abuse, many people think physical abuse, you see the marks and yes, those are the common traits, but there's also the invisible injuries. And that's what we're here to talk about traumatic brain injury, or like we prefer to say at our shelter sites, brain trauma. For a lot of survivors saying traumatic brain injury is a little stigmatizing for some, but for most, they embrace it a little bit better with brain trauma because we talk about emotional trauma. You know, we talk about other levels of trauma. So in October, 2022, we partnered up with Dr. Sussman, a very well-known neurosurgeon who basically oversees safe living space as well. And together we worked on having a trauma-informed 
traumatic, well, rather brain trauma assessment form to help survivors see if they're at high risk for having any type of brain trauma. What did we find? We found a lot. We definitely got a lot of disclosures. Uh, got a lot of folks talking more about their physical abuse that they went through, you know, and I'm a believer we have to identify the elephant in the room, so to speak. Some survivors are not in that space to talk about the abuse they went through. So we have to ask more of the questions and we did. And what we found was more than 75% of our cases basically were at high risk of having some level of brain trauma. Mm -hmm. And while that could be concerning for some, to us, it was bittersweet. Obviously, we don't want to hear, you know, about the suffering some folks go through and there's still challenges that they're facing day to day recovering from those memories. But we also want to hear it because of the fact that this is an opportunity for healing. This is an opportunity for growth so that they know that there's other factors involved besides emotional pieces of trauma that they have to recover from. There's also the physical piece. And the sooner we get them to get some medical attention, if that's needed, the sooner they're able to recover from these types of traumas. Um, Carmen, you could also speak about, Carmen is doing an excellent job. She's overseeing our Domestic Violence Traumatic Brain Injury Committee that meets once a month. And we meet with a lot of providers as well. I'm sure if you could share a little more. Sure. So uh, we started in January, 2024, and we saw this uh, DBTBI committed. And we, we're very happy to have a group of, of individuals, great women in, uh, in the committed, and including, not to say, the deputy, uh, Director Aisha Ray, the Commissioner, Ms. Rivera. And also we had a great support of our uh, Marjorie, uh, uh, Ms. Amanda Farias. She been a, a great, great companion in our pilot. She been helping us to, to even though to advocate for us, to, she submitted in February, 2024, a new uh, law about TBI, how TBI affects uh, survivors of domestic violence. And with this new law, she what she's trying to do for us is to ensure that the city train all uh, first responders in how to treat survivors of domestic violence uh, with TBI. It's like Ms. Collazo say, adding to that, Sometimes we only focus on the visible injuries, not the, not the invisible ones. And that's the one that we need to approach. That's the one that we need to take care of. Because a lot of so, victims of domestic violence, when they go to the ER, they never say that they've been a strangle, that they've been uh, hit on the head. And so the doctors, the first responders, they were unable to assist in the best way as possible. Exactly. That's very interesting that you say that because I think people think, oh, um, traumatic, in like head injuries is more like you're getting hit. That's what I honestly be thinking. But when you think about it, if you lose oxygen to the brain, that could also affect how your brain's also acting. I don't think we think about that as much either, which is very ex excellent that you brought that up in the arm um, right now, so. I think that's very good for people to know. Like, you might not think, oh, he might not have hit me all the time, but if he's been choking you out a couple of times, <laughs> I think it takes about five minutes for you to even die from um, not getting air to your brain. So imagine two or three minutes, that's going to cause some um, problems. You, I'm not sure how it works, if you can reverse it back after a while, if it's three minutes, but that's a long time for your brain not to get what it fully needs. And usually when your body is shutting down, it shut down small parts at a time to try to Preserve energy so your heart and your brain kind of work. So if stuff is shutting down in that time, um, that's not a good thing. You know what I'm saying? So just be very careful and mindful of what's happening and who's doing these things to you and stuff like that. We obviously learned a lot by getting involved more with learning about brain trauma. And we learned first and foremost from our survivors. During the pandemic, obviously, as we all know, People were scared. A lot of folks were scared to come into shelter. And a lot of that 
cause them to stay longer periods of time with the person that has abused them. And what we found when survivors were calling our hotline, what we found was they were reporting that the domestic violence escalated. It became more physical. Um, there was a lot more of what Carmen is sharing as well, the concussions, the attempted strangulations. Um, we have folks sharing a lot of what was, you know, that they were not conscious, you know, that the person abusing them would strangle them to the point where they lost the concept of time, even when they woke up. And that that serves a lot of levels of danger, even when they come to our shelter sites, because if we're not able to assess to see if they've gone through some type of brain trauma, then our safety planning basically is at risk, too. We need to be able to know all of what the survivor is going through as much as we can so we could do proper safety planning. As we know, you know, domestic violence is out there. We, we have a lot of people living in danger and it escalates when the person leaves the abusive situation that's occurring at home or wherever they are in life. And that is when safety planning is most important, actually. So we need to know what may be the limits that the person may be going through. With brain trauma, there are a lot of folks that go through a whole list of symptoms. There is the foggy memory that does occur. Um, there's also blurred vision. A lot of these symptoms could go either way. Some of them could be short-term. Some of them could be long-term. It depends on how many incidents have occurred. And how many years, actually, for a lot of the folks that come to our shelters, we're talking years, you know, and for some of them, they may have longer term symptoms, the headaches, the vomiting, the drowsiness, the fatigue, loss of balance. We have a lot of folks that have come to our sites, a lot of survivors where they've had basically the sunglasses. And it's because the light bothers them that much because of everything that happened when they were being assaulted, when they were being harmed by someone. So those are all classic symptoms that go with brain trauma. Again, they could be short-term and some can be long-term. That's why it's important to identify it. And we're doing that at our programs across all our seven DV sites. And we're asking questions that basically are trauma-informed. We ask them in a way almost as if they are talking to a friend, a counselor, it's just a casual conversation, but we have certain questions that we randomly ask periodically, and we jot it down to see where they're at. We're doing this with new intakes, and we're also doing this with existing clients that have been with us for a long time, just to see where their symptoms are. Um, and, and it's more common than what people know. You know, it's very common. And we're here to support we're here to train. We're helping other DV providers to learn more about what is brain injury, brain trauma, rather. And um, we're all working together on it in these committees that Carmen also is facilitating. So it's been helpful. I want you to explain a little bit about what a safety plan is and how can this actually change the safety plan? Because I would think no matter what the incident is, you still have to have a safety plan regardless. But if you have a an injury in the brain, would that be, make the safety plan different? Because you said it would make it a bit different. It would make it a bit different. So for example, usually our safety plans, safety plans are basically a way in which we have a plan with the survivor when they come to our sites. What are some of the pieces of things that they should reconsider doing to make sure that they maintain some level of safety? For example, every safety plan is different for every survivor. For one survivor, it may be that, for example, if the abuse occurred in Brooklyn, maybe the biggest safety plan would be basically trying to avoid parts of Brooklyn where it's known to the person that's causing the harm. For some, it may mean basically that they can go to Brooklyn because that person is no longer living there. But there's certain parts that we need to reconsider, you know, because their family may live there. We have safety plans that basically mean that, you know, you have to be aware of where you are in the train system when you're taking the train. Mm -hmm. A lot of family members known to the survivor may be taking the train, maybe, maybe be even working or commuting in the train on a daily basis. 
And what changes with a safety plan is, for example, for some survivors, if they have blurred vision or if they have the inability just to look at light, as most folks probably can because they're wearing sunglasses, light sensitivity, it impacts their safety plan because then their environment is not as clear as probably another survivor who probably doesn't have the level of brain trauma that this person has. Another piece is foggy memory. You know, for some survivors, they know who are the friends to some of the, of the people that have probably caused harm to them. But when you have foggy memory, you probably forget some of the people you've met. Some of the people that are associated with the person that has caused the harm to that person. So that foggy memory probably goes a long way and probably puts them definitely in danger. So when we do a safety plan, we make sure just to be aware of surroundings. And if it's still a little foggy, maybe avoiding certain areas that we know the person reported during their initial intake. I'm not sure if that was helpful. I hope it was. That was helpful because people, I like to make sure that people understand what we're talking about. Because some things I'm, I'll understand it because I've been doing this for a long time. But people who are listening, they didn't make sure that they understand it. Also, if a person who is in a situation right now, just listening to this, and I want to make sure they can have the information where to go for this. So everything will be down, down below to actually be able to either do this program or to make sure you can get to Safe Horizons to make sure they can help you get out of the situation. And for a lot of people... It takes more than one time to actually escape from these things, especially if you have children. So we want to make sure you get out of it safely and um, unscathed. Um, I know people myself who have gotten gunned down on the street, and you just don't want that to happen to anybody that you know or you love. You know, So I want to make sure this information is getting out there, that people, it's a way out. It might seem like it's not because it's scary at the moment. When you get on the other side, you know for a fact it'll be okay. And every day is not going to be you know, the best day because <laughs> sometimes you have memories like, oh, my gosh. Did I really go through that? But you did. And now you're a survivor. You, you made it. So we want to make sure that you have the information and know that what to look out for. If you have foggy memory, if you're a system of delight, maybe something is wrong. Because certain things you just can't see, like you said, it's not like it's a broken arm. Unless you go to a doctor and say, oh, maybe something wrong with your, your, your eyesight. You really can't tell those certain things without looking at a person. But you can tell it if you're that person looking out like, maybe I am affected by this because I am sensitive to light. Maybe because I didn't know throwing up was a thing. So all these different things what can affect your body. You might just think, oh, maybe I'm pregnant. Because a lot of these symptoms sound like a pregnancy, like things too. Like babies, people get headaches, they throw up. It's like pregnancy symptoms. But if you're not pregnant <laughs> and you just don't know, these might be things you can actually look out for and make sure, um, especially if you're at, to, at a certain point, these things are happening to you. It's time to get out before your life is getting taken away officially. Um, it's time to get out of this relationship. And I know it might be hard. It might be feeling like you, you can't get no money to do things. They have a lot of programs out here who help. Granted, it takes, especially for New York City, it does take a long time to get certain things, but there is help out there. It might take a long time. You might get discouraged because it's happening, but I promise you, you can get help. And nothing, I'm not going to promise you everything will be perfect, but you can get help. There's people out here who are fighting for you to make sure they have enough money in the budget so you can survive with you and your family. And I know people who have multiple kids who went in the system and they are now advocates today. So don't be discouraged about what's happening right now, because there is a better end to the situation, I promise. I can promise that part, okay? So yes, um, how can they get part of this program? How can they, how, like, is it only certain places? You said seven sites, so how does it work for a person to get it if they want to be in this program? So for some survivors, they tend to call, as you mentioned, Safe Horizon. There's other avenues. But to go through Volunteers of America, we also have one main gateway that we just opened up as of recently, our hotline. And our hotline is, if I could share, 1-855-643-RISE, which is 7473. Again, is 1-855-643-RISE, four digits. And that's our hotline number, or rather helpline number, and anybody who has questions on what we talked about today, or if they're looking for a safe place, whether it's due to domestic violence, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, or if you are homeless, but still need a safe place, you could call this hotline number and one of our advocates will answer, will assess if which boroughs are a safe place for you or what works for you. 
and then we will guide you to our confidential locations. All of our locations are confidential. It's not shared to the public. Um, these are locations that are basically in areas that are very close to transportation. So it's helpful for survivors to get back and forth to whatever they need to do, whether work or appointments. But we're 24 hours, seven days a week. We have social workers, case managers. We are passionate about this work. And we've been doing this work for a very long time. And we're here to support. And survivors are not alone. You know, you can call just to ask questions. You might not be ready to go to shelter when you call us. And that's fine. You know, it's a step-by-step -step process. But we're here to support and just have the conversation. So definitely give us a call. For sure, for sure. Please don't feel afraid. And I'm, I'm a person who never actually been through a domestic violence situation. But I definitely hold the hands and hold up the stories that I know to make sure that people know that it's going to be okay. And that you know, the people who lost their lives because people just think they have more time. And you honestly, no day is, you know, we don't know what's going to happen day by day, but if we can get ourselves out of that situation to get to a better place for yourself. That's a great, just don't be scared. You're not alone. There's people here who are really here for you. You know what I'm saying? So um, what things you think other than the hotline, because everything will be listed down below also. Like she said it, we're also going to make sure you list it down below to make sure you get it. It's going to be probably, I would say, in our resource packet that we um, have in the link tree down below also. It's something we're going to add to it to make sure people know where to go. Even if, if you don't see this episode, if you don't see it, I guess you won't hear this part, but we just want to make sure this is always giving out and things like that. Is this a pilot program? I didn't ask that part. Or is it going to be a, a, is an ongoing thing that we have, you know, budgets for and things like that? So we started out as a pilot program. It still is, but we're moving forward. I mean, the questions that we ask our survivors, we're putting it now in our intake so that we can ask more about what are the possible physical injuries they went through. And I'm going to be very transparent with you. With these questions, we've been able to work more and more with disclosures on, you know, those folks who've gone through some sexual violence even those survivors of human trafficking that we are seeing more and more are sharing that they were possibly trafficked. So these questions have opened up a lot of doors, not just about brain trauma, but so much more, you know, and it's all about healing. It, it really is all about the healing. And, and it's very common for survivors to go through some level of brain trauma. And the sooner that you know, the sooner that you can heal even quickly from some of the traumas and symptoms that you're going through right now. I'm happy that you brought up trafficking. I think a lot of times, I've been learning this year too and last year um, more and more about trafficking. I feel like we don't know enough about it. It's happening all over the place, all over oh, the yes. world. And it's really getting from bad to worse, <laughs> if I want to say that, but it's always been bad because it's just, you know, having somebody do something against their will. And um, a lot of times people getting stuck into that world because they, they feel like they have nothing to offer or just different reason why people get, they want money at first and they start off from one thing and all of a sudden it builds into something else. And um, I it's interesting how now we, a lot of people who are in the DV world, they were, a lot of people were trafficking. They just didn't know, or, you know, they get into that part. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people who are trafficking, they get, well, I would say all probably. I'm not really sure that the, the um, actual numbers, but they are getting beaten. They are getting forced to do certain things they don't want to get do against their will. And a lot of those categories intersect with trafficking. Um, trafficking Awareness Month was last month again, but this is another topic like DV that is not only to be talked about once a year, when it's a month that we're in, when it's literally happening every single day. Girls, men, children are missing because they're put into that system but don't even be a system in the first place. And um, because of the rate of how things are, a lot of people don't get convicted for, they can't catch the person and stuff like that. But please don't make yourself um, get into these positions. I know sometimes you can't even help it because you just, just you're on, honestly in survival mode. And when people are in survival mode, they get into things they don't want to get into. But if you're a person who has been trafficking, you know, I know the way we're going to be listening this is DV. If you're a person who hears this and hear what we're talking about, please call the number. Please get the help. They can help you the best that they can and then try get you out of that system to make sure you and your family, not at this point, most times, but you're by yourself, but you and your, get yourself out of the situation. You know what I'm saying? So please take this information. No thing is only, only people with DV. No, you're having DV right now and not even realizing it. 
that person does not love you. If they're putting you in a situation, they don't care about you. If they're hitting you every day, taking your money that you technically are making yourself, they don't love you. Um, and making you do things that you don't want to do. They do not love you. People who love you do not treat you that way. So um, just take heed of all the things that we're talking about. Do you have any last words for the people um, that you would like to tell about this program and how it can change their lives? Definitely, there is definite hope. There's support. We have definitely many advocates that work across our seven DV shelter sites who basically represent the communities that we serve. And we also have those advocates that work with us. Many of them are survivors themselves and, and they get the work. And even if you're not a survivor and doing this work, we get the work as well. We're here to support, we're here to give options and self-determination is key at our shelter sites. We work with whoever wants to start to do the recovery at the, at the level of where they wanna go, slow, quick, whatever it is. We're here to support. And there is a lot of options out there. I want survivors to know that. There are options, you're not alone. A lot of what you have gone through is horrible. And many times we feel that we're alone a lot of the times in the horror that goes through when someone that you love is harming you. But there is support, there is options, you're not alone. If you are curious to learn more, definitely give us a call. You know, if you want one day to stay at a shelter site, just to really think about things, that's fine too. These are all volunteer services, but there are options and definitely you're not alone. You're not alone. There's people out there that are going through the same thing as well. I can honestly say from a person who has been in a shelter and not for this particular thing, but you, one thing I wanna say, people, a lot of people in the shelter right now, especially family shelter, a lot of them are DV survivors. Um, we don't talk about that, but the biggest population in New York City our families and a lot of the families are DV survivors. Um, being in shelter is not the easiest thing. You get to house in a family shelter, so it's much better than a single shelter, in my opinion, from what the way I see they have to live. Um, because it's it's congregate when your family they give you your own space. But even when you have your own space, it's still it doesn't feel great. I promise you. It doesn't feel the greatest. You can get depressed in there. Some people have wonderful stories. Some people not so wonderful. But I tell you, having your life is better than not having your life. And these things for DV, it's a cycle. One minute, like we scream at you, next couple of months, it might not happen till again. But to people yell at each other, people get angry. But when it gets to the point when it's name calling and being nasty towards you, spitting on you, taking your money, that's when it, it, it draws the line. You know what I'm saying? People can have arguments, but when it gets to a past an argument, that's when the problem is really going in. So I'm, I know being in shelter does not sound cool. I know people think, oh my God, you go in shelter, you get housing right away. You don't, <laughs> unless you're a high earner. Um, but even high earners at this point sometimes can't even get apartments properly in New York City because everything is so expensive and it's just like, you can't find an apartment. It's not the glamorous place to be, but I promise you your life will be better for doing this decision. And we are here to help you. Um, my link tree will be down below also if you wanna talk to me about anything. If I don't know the answers, I will get to a person who knows the answers to be able to help you. I want you to have the best, the most information to make the best decisions for you and your family's lives. And if you're not a person who's a family for your life, you know what I'm saying? These kind of topics are for everybody because it can affect anybody. And a lot of times we think it's just like, that person just want to be that way. No, somebody's coercing them to be that way. Um, and it's not always, a, it's not a pretty thing. It's not always a pretty thing. There's never a pretty thing that person's getting hurt or being treated a certain way. So please, if you know somebody who you want to send this to, please do that. If you know somebody you think this is happening to and send them over that, please do that. If you're a person who's listening to this and like maybe a fitness category, call in and they'll can act, they can help you. If you don't, if you're not sure, you maybe think yes, probably honestly it's happening to you. You just need a person outside of your head to tell you, yes, this is happening to you and you need to get help. Don't wait to the point that you are on life support in a hospital. And if you're if you're already gone, it's too late to do it then. So please get the help that you need. Know that these things can affect your brain and your brain and your heart is the things that we need to really survive. Um, you can probably do, you can do it out of arm, you can do it out of leg, but if your heart is not pumping, that's a problem. If your brain is not working, your vegetables like these things that you need to be able to survive in life. You know what I'm saying? So please don't make it get to the point that you don't have these functions in your body. So thank you for listening, guys. Thank you for being amazing. Thank you for watching Hair Voices, and please follow us on all our social media platforms. I know this is a heavy subject, but it has to be done. 
and I'm here to do it. And I'm here to give you the things that you need, the tools that you need to be able to survive in life. So thank you and see you next time. Bye. You. Bye. Bye.